So this morning, uh, we are uh, in our second week, uh, in our second part of our series in the book of John. Um, we started John a couple years ago in 2022. We did the first four chapters, and now we're going to be covering chapters 5 through 12. And now, in case you're rusty on your context of John, it was written by a guy named... You guys are sharp, right? He was one of the disciples of Jesus. He is the same John who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. You guys are good. So you're good. And he also wrote the very last book in the Bible, which is? All right, three for three. Now, the context of the book is it's been about 50 years uh, since the, the, the life and the death of Christ, and, and the gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke have all been written. And, and so John decides to write down his own gospel with additional information about the life of Jesus. And really, the focus of John, in a nutshell, is that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, as we read in John 14. And that is what we focused on in the first four chapters a couple years ago, just refocusing us at the grandeur, getting us to marvel at the name of Jesus. Because if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know in our sin nature that it is easy to grow numb to the majesty of Jesus. It's easy to hear the same things you've always heard. It's easy to sing the same songs you've always sung. It's easy to hear the same scriptures you've always heard or read and just to get used to it. To no longer stand in, in, in amazement uh, or astonishment for who he was and who he is and who he is to come. Even as a pastor, I, I, if I am not careful, I can get in the rut that these truths just no longer sink into my soul. Well, the book, the book of John is the perfect cure for all of that. In fact, we, we just uh, read this uh, in our daily Bible reading in the New Testament that we're doing together as a church, that in chapter 1, there's 22 different names of Jesus alone. John calls him the Christ and the Lord, the Word, calls him God, calls him the life, the true light, among others. 22 different titles, and that's in the first chapter alone. As Billy Sunday said, uh, he was an evangelist that was uh, alive a century ago. He said that there are over 200 names for Jesus in the Bible. 200 names for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes, I suppose it's because Jesus was ineff ineff infinitely, in I can't get that word out, infinitive, in infin infinitely, infinite. Thank you. Beyond all any one name could ever express. And I have to say a hearty amen to that. I can pronounce that one. Now, as we get to section two, John chapters five through 12, you're going to see opposition rise up against Jesus. Just like you see opposition rise up against the name of Jesus today. And we're going to look and pay attention to how Jesus responds to this opposition. And if we pay attention, we'll learn some important truths. We'll see what it means to recognize Jesus' authority in this world. We'll understand the true cost of what it means to really follow Jesus. We'll learn how we can avoid spiritual blindness in our lives. And what it looks like to walk in the light. And my goal and my prayer is that if you sit here today and your faith is in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior that it will prepare you to face the opposition that you will face if you are boldly pronouncing his name with perseverance and with faith. And if you sit here today and you're still figuring out who God is, that it will reveal to you that the only one worthy of your faith is the Lord Jesus Christ. For as we read in Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Amen, church? Now, we're in John 5 today. John, Tim kicked us off last week, uh, the first 15 or 16 verses. We saw Jesus go heal a man who had not been able to walk in, in nearly 40 years. Now, while you would think everybody would be amazed and they would rejoice and, you know, high five, and like, this is awesome, this was not totally the case. There are some who are very angry about this healing. We'll start in John chapter 5, verse 15. The man went away, the man that Jesus just healed, and he told the Jews that if it was Jesus who had healed him, 
And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. So as I said just a minute ago, in this series, we're really focusing on the the opposition Jesus was going to face. And and what we're reading here, this is the start of it all. This is where the enemies of Jesus began to take notice of him when he started doing things on the Sabbath. These are the moments that kicked off his journey to the cross. Now, remember, if you remember your Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, Jesus, the God laid down one of the commandments was to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. This was a mandatory day for the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. It was a day of rest and a day of remembrance. So the Jewish people took it seriously. They actually had punishments for people who broke the Sabbath. You could be separated from the nation of Israel, separated from your people, cut off from them if you did not obey it. Even death. This is how serious they took it. Unfortunately, over time, as we are prone to do as humans, the Jews lost the meaning of the Sabbath. And they began adding a bunch of uh, extra rules and, and regulations on the Sabbath, that were not in, uh, originally there. And you still see some Jews uh, uh, obeying these today. This is why if you go to some hospitals like in New York, it, on Sundays it stops at every floor because it's considered work to push the elevator button. All of these rules and regulations that were exploiting and taking uh, Jews' eyes off the original meaning of the Sabbath. And so they practice this over time, and all these traditions grow into place. And then 1,400 years later, Jesus shows up, and he heals a man on the Sabbath, and he starts challenging all of these extra rules and and regulations, and he starts challenging them uh, on how they view the commandment and, and their compassion for those who are ill. Now, how does Jesus respond to this? He says in verse 17, my father is working until now, and so I am working. Now, what does that mean? We read back in Genesis, we studied this last year, that on the seventh day, God did what? He rested. God rested. Now, this is not to be interpreted that God took a nap, right? He did not get into his hammock and go to sleep, okay? It does not interpret it to mean he became inactive for an entire day. On the contrary, God is constantly at work in our world. He gives, and he's sustaining life and sustaining the world, constantly at work. And so the Jewish rabbis concluded when they would discuss these types of matters that that even though man was beholden to the Sabbath, God was not. So in a nutshell, what Jesus is saying, it's okay for me to do work on the Sabbath. It's okay for me to heal because I am equal to God. Nowadays, If someone were to say that they were equal to God, we would probably make fun of them because it happens quite often. But back then, they took it very seriously. So seriously, this is why they wanted to kill him. As I said, these are some of the first words that would ultimately lead to the death of Jesus. He says, I'm like God. Then he goes and he pushes the envelope even farther in verse 19. Let me read the next 10 verses. It says, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. And whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, he has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed on from death to life. 
Truly, I truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is here, is now here, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who will hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. This is a reference in a prophecy in the book of Daniel. Verse 28, so do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So let me just break down what he's saying in these 10 verses. Jesus is saying, look, I can do only what God can do. God loves me. He is my father. He's revealed his perfect will to me, and I carry out that will with his power. Jesus says, I am worthy of the honor that is only worthy given to God. Internal life comes from believing in me like it comes from believing in God. You cannot honor God without honoring me. Jesus says, I have the power that only God can claim. I have the authority to bring judgment. I have the power of life and death, which the Old Testament makes clear is a prerogative of God. He says, I am equal to God. Now, Jesus didn't have to answer this way. He could have just scolded them about their view of the Sabbath and how they were getting it wrong and, and, and their lack of compassion for others. But he chose to go and change the discussion into a much greater discussion. Now, what is he doing here? What is he doing in these gospel verses that we've read so many times? He's putting his listeners to a decision. This is what he's doing. He's not beating around the bush about his standing in the universe. He said, this is who I am. Now you have to deal with that. Bring this forward to present time. There are many views of Jesus. Uh, he was a prophet, uh, a philosopher, he was a healer, a moral teacher. I mean, if someone asked you, especially if you sit here today and you are not a Christian, who Jesus was, how would you reply? Now, personally, I think those who list out any of the, uh, any of the titles I just read, they haven't fully read their Gospels. Because Jesus literally claims to be God. So many other verses we're not even covering today where he does that. I mean, in the eyes of Jesus, there is no other title that is befitting him. And he's saying, you have to deal with that. C.S. Lewis, he, he said, he, when he writing on this, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, look, Jesus claimed to be God. So he was one of three things. He said, either he was a lunatic, he was a nutcase, like most of the people we would classify today that say they're God, or he was a liar, or he was in fact Lord. That's it. Those are the options based on the claims that Jesus made. And so the words of God, the words of John, today they put us to the same decision that Jesus put the Jews back then. You have to decide what you're going to do with Jesus. He says through his word today in his spirit, I am God, I am judge, I am salvation. Will you submit to me or not? Now, our culture does not like this. We live in a world of pluralism uh, and, 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 and tolerance. And, 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 and this, in this buildup of these uh, values, like tolerance and, and pluralism, it exerts enormous pressure on us to, as Christians, to cover up any of the distinctives of our faith that might offend others. We will hear, I've heard people say, you know, it's fine to think Jesus is a way to God. Just don't make him the only way. It's fine to affirm Jesus as one version of the truth, but make no claim that he's the only way up the mountain. And to otherwise, it's, it's, to speak otherwise, it's like it's blasphemy. 
It's blasphemy to this process and this, this value, this desire that we uphold of, of interfaith discourse. And, and, and I think, and even more over recent years, maybe the last decade or two, Christians are, are I feel like, are generally held suspect in the public square because most assume, no matter how kind we are or giving we are, that lurking beneath the surface of our actions and our words is this absolute argument for absolute truth. That we want to upend secular systems of, of other faith, of pluralism and tolerance and inner faith, and, and they would be right. <laughs> we do. I do. Jesus left zero wiggle room, zero, in his truth claims about himself. And he was crucified for it. The earlier followers of Jesus, they left zero wiggle room for their truth claims about Jesus. They would not budge. They were most all murdered for it. And today, through Scripture, we are called to preach the name of Jesus. Because there, we believe there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved in Acts 4. And even today, if you are brave enough and you're actually living out your faith to boldly proclaim the name of Jesus as the only way, the only truth, and the only life, you're going to feel the pressure from those who do not like being put to that decision. In fact, if you sit here to say, I'm a Christian, yes. I want you to think about the last time you felt that pressure. Now, I'm not talking about social media posts. Those are easy. I'm talking about one-on-one -on -one or in group dialogues where you're taking a stand for Christ, where you felt that pressure that people didn't like being put to that decision. If you cannot think of one, maybe it's because you haven't woken up yet, not enough caffeine, but it may be the fact also that maybe it's because you're not living boldly for the name of Christ. Maybe you're not willing to preach or share the name of Christ so boldly that it puts people to that kind of decision. We must, like Christ, be willing to put people to that, that, that decision. Not to tiptoe, to beat around the bush but to boldly proclaim the death and resurrection of Jesus. Matthew 10, 32, Jesus says, Everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. I bring all this up because I believe one of the devices of the devil, one of the attacks of Satan, is trying uh, on the deity of Christ is this whole religion of tolerance that I've ta been talking about. The cry for tolerance, which is not really tolerance that's wanted. The tolerance that says all, all people that have the right to choose what they believe. Now, as Christians, I believe we should gladly support this kind of tolerance. We do not want to force someone or coerce someone to become a Christian. And it's not possible to do that anyway. It's impossible. It's a decision of the heart. You can't force anyone to become a Christian. God has never forced anyone to become a Christian. He said, here's who I am. Decide. People should have the right to believe whatever they want to believe, even if it's something crazy. If someone wants to set up a religion uh, uh, that worships a toaster... Go for it. But the religion of tolerance that we see in this world today, it's not really about tolerance. It's about pressing the idea that all religions are okay and they're all equally true. But that's not tolerance. That's a new religion. And, I th and like I said, I think Satan pushes this because he wants it to undermine and undercut the deity of Jesus Christ. Undermine the worship of Jesus as the one true Lord. So I encourage you today, my brothers and sisters who are in Christ, do not give in to this pressure. Speak boldly the name of Jesus. Be willing to put people to the decision by being very clear about who Christ is. 
Are you with me, church? And preparing yourself to do so. Peter said, always be prepared. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the hope that you have. Are you prepared this morning to do that? He says, but also do this with gentleness and respect. And I want to make sure to add that because I've come across many Christians, uh, I feel like in my time, who think they're being persecuted for their faith, but really they're just being persecuted for their personality. There's a difference. You can be bold. You can put people to a decision like Christ did and yet be gentle and do it with respect like Christ did. Now, people who buy into tolerance, I don't think tolerance is the real reason they have a problem with Christianity. I think there's something behind it. Just like the people who wanted to kill Jesus, I don't think the Sabbath uh, and, and, and necessarily him claiming to be God was the reason they wanted to kill him. I think there was something behind it. And I think that's because they saw Jesus as a threat. Among the Jewish time, when the Jews during this time, they were under Roman occupation. So like the highest prestige, the highest honor they could ever have, the highest position of authority was religious authority. And so these authorities that confronted Jesus, and you see this all throughout the next seven chapters, they had worked hard to obtain and maintain these, this power and this prestige. And then Jesus steps in. And he challenges the legitimacy of their leadership like never before. He, he starts exposing their hearts, their, uh, their false pretenses. And he claims a higher authority than them. He starts cutting through all the, the technicalities of the law that, that preserve their position and their power and got people to look up to him, their celebrity. And because they were focused on him as a threat, as a rival, I think they were blind to who Jesus was. They didn't even stop to think, okay, could this be the Messiah that we are waiting for? And I think in the same way today, so many people reject Jesus, they dismiss, dismiss him so quickly because at the end of the day, he's a rival to the God that they really want to serve, which is themselves. I say it every week, I think. Every single one of us sitting in here or watching online, we're people of faith. Every one of us. It just matters where our faith is. And if we don't have our faith in, 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 in some other God, some other religion that we're attached to, if we don't have our faith in the one true God, really at the end of our day, the faith is in ourselves as God. You, everyone has a God in their lives. Everyone has an authority, a principle that rises above everything else, that everything is bounced off, everything is judged by. But we don't like the words of Jesus because you know what Jesus tells us? He goes, I'm the judge. He goes, one day I'm going to judge you and you're not good enough on your own. Your deeds will never be good enough. You are filled with sin. You have failed God. We don't like to hear that. We like being in control and doing what we want to do, when we want to do it, how we want to do it, and why we want to do it. And believing in Jesus means you can't keep your control. You can't keep your power. You can't keep all the things you think are important and are working towards. You have to submit every area, every area of your life to him. Your job, your, your money, your marriage, your, your, your parenting, if you're a kid, your schooling, your free time, everything must be submitted to the king. We don't like that. So people don't want to even look at him. They want to ignore him. They want to discredit him. But Jesus says here clearly, once again, putting people to a decision, you will not be able to ignore me forever. This is the time of grace where I'm allowing you to bend your knee to me, but there will come a day where you will be forced to bend your knee to me. Revelation 22, behold, I am coming soon. I am bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the alpha and omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Today, I believe there'll be people listening to this message and through his word and his Holy Spirit, he is putting you to a decision.
Will you submit your life to Jesus? For one day, judgment will come. You know, and, and I want you to notice, I want you to see something specific about this judgment. Because some of you, the way that you grew up learning about God, there's some confusion on what it means to believe in Jesus. We learn in verse 29 that judgment will be based on our deeds. It says, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Now, this can puzzle some people because we preach week in and week out, time and time and time again. We say this over and over and over and over and over that we do not get to heaven. We do not, our, our faith is not based on works. Our salvation, is, rather, is not based on works. It's based on faith in Jesus and the work that he has done, period. And he says this five verses later. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Is there a contradiction? Not a bit. What Jesus is saying here is what the Bible says almost everywhere. Your deeds, they're like an index to your heart. They're an index to your heart. Like when I look at the index, if I go in the Bible and, you know, and, I, and I bust open the index to the Bible and it tells me what is in here. It tells me what maps are in here, what books of the Bible are in here. It, it tells me what I'm going to find. Your deeds are an index to your heart. Take the fruit. We're in growing season here, right? Like the, the fruit on a tree does not give tree to uh, tree life. It, it's the life of the tree that produces the fruit. It's a sign of life on the inside. James goes on about this passionately. He says in James 2.18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. I want you to feel the weight of what I'm saying here. The Bible is saying, Jesus is saying, People who are saved on Judgment Day are not people who say they believe. I come across a lot of people who say, you believe in Jesus? Oh, I believe in Jesus. Oh, I'm a Christian. People who are saved are those who actually, truly, really believe. If you truly believe in Jesus, your heart will change. Your words will change. Your actions will change. Your reactions will change. Your goals will change. Your desires will change. Your priorities will change. Your direction will, every area of your life will change. You will start to go to this book and you will start reading about how, who God is and who he's calling you to be. And it will be a goal of your life to do the things in this book, albeit not perfectly, but over time, more and more and more. Your prayer life, you will constantly be leaning on God, saying, God, I need your help to do these things because there's a desire and you believe in him to help me. There'll be repentance. When you mess up, you'll be going to him. Everything in your life will change. That's someone who truly believes. If you truly believe in Christ, everything in your life will change. You are not saved by your deeds, no but your deeds will reveal if you are saved. Are you with me, church? Amen. So my goal and my hope is that we would all take a long look in the mirror today and say, am I am someone who says I believe or am I someone who lives as if I truly believe? We're being put to a decision. You know, and, and the beauty thing here is like the judgment of God. Some people are like, I don't want to come to God because of fear. Listen, fear keeps me from running out in the middle of the road and getting hit by a truck, right? Fear is not always a bad thing. Fear keeps me from doing a lot of stupid things that I would just normally do. But the judgment of God should not just bring fear. It also brings freedom. 
It brings sweet freedom. Oh my goodness. It's one of the beautiful things about the doctrine of judgment that no one realizes. The judgment of Christ, seeing him as judge, frees us. Like even in this chapter, he's making a judgment, and you read about this in the other gospels, about how they handle the Sabbath and their attitude towards the Sabbath. And if they would only listen to his words and his judgment, they'd be freed from all of these extra rules and all these, these extra regulations that are absolutely not needed and miss the complete point. In the same way, in our lives, when you look to Jesus as judge, he is my judge, my faith is in him, you free yourself from the other judge in your life, the, the worst judge of all, yourself. We all have in us ingrained justice, a need for justice. I don't know where people who have, don't have faith in God think that universally comes from, but God placed it in our hearts. And with justice, there is need of a judge. And just because we don't look to God as judge doesn't mean we just go around thinking that no judge is needed. What we do is we start putting ourselves in that place whether we know it or not. I was reading recently an article, uh, an article on eating disorders. Uh, it was um, something I've been thinking about recently. And, uh, and it, was, it was saying that generally, I was talking about women, uh, just women specifically in eating disorders, that a woman will feel, who has an eating disorder, will feel that she can control her life by controlling her weight. She has control over nothing else. She can control that. And, and she needs that control. Uh, she, get, she gets a sense of, of power and control over her life by being thin. Even when every other area of her life is out of control, this is the one thing she can. And, and the thing is, she's the judge of whether she's thin or not. And so, so she does, she's not liberated by this. She's actually enslaved by this. Because what happens if you have ever struggled with this or you know someone who has is that every time you look in that mirror, no matter what size you are, even if you're about to die from starvation, a woman will look in the mirror who struggles with it and she'll say what? I'm fat. I'm fat. Now, I know for some of you, this seems like a very remote problem but it really isn't, not the heart of the problem anyway. Because every one of us, we have areas in our lives where we try to keep control or mastery over ourselves. And instead of liberating us, it, it, it turns us into our own judge. It drives us, just like the Jews who use the Sabbath and obeying the Sabbath and all of these extra rules to validate themselves. Every one of you, you have a different way in which you try to take control in your life. And maybe it's not through eating. Maybe it's not through weight. It could be through your job or, or perfectionism. It could be your family. Whatever it is, you're always looking in this mirror in your life. And you're always being haunted. I'm not good enough. You never measure up. Have I... Any, unless somebody's like a narcissist, you never get, none of you ever got in the mirror and you're like, man, I'm all right. I got it together. We always have things in our lives that are judging and condemning us. And we don't realize part of the reason for that is because we've replaced the one true judge with a false judge that has no business being in that place. I mean, think about it. Who are we to create judgments? I mean, right now, like I said, you know, a woman looks into the mirror and she's like, I'm, I'm fat, I'm not thin. You go back into past centuries, people didn't want to be thin. They wanted to be curvy. That was considered beautiful then. Society can't even make up its mind. Give it another 100 years and it'll probably change back. And yet, we still use that standard to judge ourselves. Why? Because we do not have the one true judge in his place. If you choose to be your own king, if you choose to be your own judge, you're going to end up judging yourself right into the ground. Jesus says, I am the only one qualified to be king. 
to be the judge. In fact, I remember reading a particular uh, a woman. She got freedom uh, through the gospel of Jesus from eating disorders. And she goes, one day the gospel just hit me. That God took all my judgment, all my sin, everything I deserved, and he put it up on the cross. And so she goes, I learned to say something to myself. That when I look in the mirror, I'll say, look, I'm not thin. God did not give me a runway model figure. But God gave me other things. And he's in control of my life, not me. So I'm going to honor him with what I have. I'm going to try to eat healthy because that's honoring my body. But I'm going to serve him with what I have, no matter what I look like. I don't have to be in control of my weight. I just need to be obedient in his word, and I'll let him be in control of my life. And she says, I get in the mirror, and every time I start to judge myself, I go to the one true judge who took my judgment, and he put it all on the cross. And it frees me from all other judgments. Isn't that beautiful? What if every time we got in front of the proverbial mirror of life and we start to judge ourselves for all of these things, we remembered the one true judge who put all the judgment we ever deserved up on the cross and that our value is no longer in what we think about ourselves and our judgment. Our value is found in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ who through faith we become sons and daughters of the king. What a beautiful way to look at the judgment of God. Is it not, church? 